This is the last chapter in our group of three, and this covers joints. And joints are called articulations. That's the site where two or more bones come together, or two or more bones meet. What do joints do? They give the skeleton mobility, and they help to hold the bones that make up the skeleton together. Now, there are two classifications. There's a functional classification, which is looking at how much movement you get with the joints. And then structural is how the joints are put together. So the functional classification of joints is based on the amount of movement that the joint allows. And there's three functional classifications, and to me it's all very sad, S-A-D. Synarthroses, remember ES is the pluralized version, S-I-S, synarthrosis is singular. Synarthroses are immovable joints. Amphiarthroses, slightly movable joints. And diarthroses are freely movable joints. Structural classification is based on the material that binds the, jo the bones together. And the joints could have a joint cavity but you only find joint cavities in synovial joints, the last category. So the three structural classifications are fibrous joints. They have fibrous connective tissue holding them together. Cartilaginous joints, the bones are put together by some type of cartilage. And synovial joints are very complex and they have a joint cavity. So fibrous joints are where the bones are joined by dense fibrous connective tissue. There is no joint cavity and most are called synarthrotic. They're immovable joints. Usually it depends on the length of the connective tissue fibers that joins the bones together. Now there are three types of fibrous joints. Sutures, syndesmoses, and gomphoses. So sutures are what holds the skull bones together and they're very short interconnecting fibers and the skull bone edges usually interlock and these are only found in the skull. Now as people age, you'll find this on the notes on page one, that a lot of times these sutures will um, calcify and the bones will fuse together. And these fused sutures are called synostases. S-Y-N-O-S-T-O-S-E-S. -S -E -S. Now, the second kind is called a gomphosis, and a gomphosis is like a peg in a socket. And the tissue that holds the teeth to the jawbone is called the periodontal ligament, and that anchors the teeth right to the alveolar processes in the maxilla and in the mandible, and these are also considered synarthrotic joints. Teeth are immovable, or they should be. Then you have syndesmosis. Now the syndesmosis is made up of a ligament that holds together the distal ends of the ulna and the radius and the tibia and the fibula. So you can see the relationship here between the ligament that joins the fibula to the tibia. Now we move to cartilaginous joints. Bones are united by cartilage. There's no joint cavity again. They're not highly movable, and there are two types. The words get a little bit, you know, sketchy in this, in this chapter. A lot of them sound alike, so you really want to make yourself some note cards and really pay attention to how the words are spelled and how they're pronounced. But you have synchondrosis and symphysis, okay? And you remember, chondra means cartilage. So this is a type of cartilaginous joint. And um, symphysis, we'll talk about both of these, and I'll give you examples of both of these. So here you have a synchondrosis. And a synchondrosis is where you have bones that are joined together by hyaline cartilage. Okay, So that's what makes this a synchondrosis, hyaline cartilage. So examples are the epiphyseal plates in children, the joint between the costal cartilage of the first rib and the sternum. Now the rest of the sternocostal joints are synovial plane joints, so they don't fall into this category in case you have that question. 
So those are synchondroses. The next cartilaginous type of joint is called a symphysis or symphyses. And when you look at the relationship between the intervertebral disc and the vertebrae, there's limited movement in these joints. They're designed for strength and flexibility. So you have um, fibrocartilage associated with these joints. So it's a fibrocartilaginous intervertebral disc sandwiched between two hyaline cartilage bands, which is the articular cartilage of the vertebrae. And you also have an example with the pubic symphysis. So when you think of symphyses, pubic symphysis, the name really should link them together. This is the synovial joint. This is the most complex of the joints. And you will find that there is a general structure. These joints um, are separated by a fluid containing joint cavity. They are all freely movable diarthrotic joints. And the examples are all of your limb joints and most of the joints of the body fall into this category. So you have all of these structures in common with synovial joints. They all have articulating cartilage right there. There's your articulating cartilage. They all have an articular cavity, a joint cavity. And the articular capsule is what goes around. And you can see that here. The articular ca um, capsule is made up of this fibrous connective tissue of the um, joint of the joint and then you also have the synovial membrane on the inside that secretes the synovial fluid and the fluid fills this open space here. And then you have reinforcing ligaments and the reinforcing ligaments you can see one here it supports the joint and gives it more strength and um, sometimes you have what are called act um, extracapsular joints, those are on the outside, and some joints you have intracapsular ligaments, like in the case of the knee, you have the cruciate ligaments, and those are on the inside. So those are all structures associated with the synovial joint. Now synovial fluid is kind of interesting because it's a lubricant, and it has a very slippery type of a feel to it, and it's because it has hyaluronic acid in it. Hyaluronic acid is what you find in egg whites, and that makes egg whites very slippery as well. So this is a very, um, is a very greasy type of lubricating fluid, and it helps the joints to move in kind of a friction-free environment. Now there are associated structures, accessory structures, with a synovial joint. And we talked about the synovial membrane being on the inside of the joint cavity and it lines the joint cavity. And this membrane is what secretes the synovial fluid. Well, sometimes you have these little flattened sacs of synovial membrane that act as um, protective structures that go in between bones where they come in contact with each other or ligaments and tendons so that you reduce friction. So you have something called a bursa and you can see a bursa here. This is the subacromial bursa underneath the acromion of the scapula and these bursa are flattened uh, sacs that have a little bit of synovial fluid that kind of act as little cushions. So the, um, the bursa you see there, and then you have something called a tendon sheath. And this is an elongated bursa that wraps completely around a tendon, just like a hot dog bun wraps around a hot dog. And it just adds a little bit of cushion where tendons might be inclined to rub up against a bone, and it can cause a lot of irritation, a lot of, uh, a lot of pain. And sometimes, depending upon the joint, you can have quite a few of these. Now in the knee, there's about 13 associated bursa. So wherever you have tissues coming together, ligaments, muscles, skin, tendons, bones rubbing together, this is where you will find these types of structures that will minimize the friction involved. Now there's three stabilizing features at synovial joints. And what really, what really determines the, the stability is the bone surfaces that come together, the ligaments associated with them, and the action of the muscles and the tendons. 
and the muscles have two points of attachment the origin which is the attachment to the immovable bone and the insert and the insertion which is the attachment to the now these are some movements allowed by synovial joints so a lot of your joints flex and extend so this is showing you flexion and extension at the neck and you can also hyperextend the joint which could lead to injury here you have some more angular movements allowed by synovial joints. You have flexion, extension, and hyperextension hyper of the vertebral column. So you can see flexion, like taking a bow, extension, and hyperextension. These are more types of flexion and extension and hyperextension, and this is involving the shoulder and the knee. So flexion of the entire arm is bringing the arms forward at the shoulders, um, extension bringing them back, and you can also hyperextend the shoulder. Um, at the knee, you have flexion. Incidentally, this is the only joint in the body that flexes to the pos in the posterior direction. And then extension bringing the knee back to a straightened position. Then you have what's called abduction and adduction. And really pay attention because there's only one letter difference uh, between the two words. But abduction is taking away the arms from the side of the body, bringing them out laterally. Like if you're abducting someone, you're taking them away. So you're taking it away from the midline of the body adduction, adding it to the midline, so you're bringing the arms down, adding it to the body. So adduction, bringing them closer to the midline of the body, abduction, taking them away. And then if you put the arm out and you're transcribing a cone in space, that's circumduction. Jutting the jaw forward is protraction of the mandible. Pulling the jaw back is retraction of the mandible. Um, you can rotate the head, you can rotate the arm, you can rotate the leg. And with the leg, lateral rotation is turning the foot to the side. Medial rotation is turning the foot inward. Okay, with the hands, if the palm is facing up, that's supination. Palm facing down is pronation. When the hand is in the supine position, look at the forearm bones. They're parallel. And when you pronate the hand, turn the palm down, the only bone that moves is the radius. The radius crosses over the ulna and they form an X. The foot is dorsiflexed when the toe is pointing up and plantar flexion toe is pointing down like a ballerina standing up on her tiptoes during a performance. Inversion, eversion. These terms only appear, only apply to feet. Inversion is turning the foot inward. Eversion, turning the foot outward. Opposition is where you're actually opposing the other fingers. So you are touching the thumb to the other fingers. This shows you um, the different types of joints that you have. These are classifications of synovial joints based on the type of arrangement or shape of the articulating surfaces that come together. And the most movable of all of these is the ball and socket joint at the top left. And that's where you have like a round spherical shape that fits into a cup-like depression on another bone. These are the most movable of all the joints in the body. So you're talking about the shoulder and the hip here. And then if you go over to the right, you have a hinge joint. Um, this is what you find in your joints that can flex and extend a lot of times. So in your elbow is a good example. So you have like a rounded process that fits into like a trough of a, another bone. Um, so inter uh, phalangeal, phalangeal joints like in between the fingers and the elbow are good examples of these. Um, second one down from the left, pivot joint, 
rounded end of one bone kind of goes into a sleeve and possibly ligaments of another bone usually only uh, monaxial movement like we saw between the axis and the dens um, also the proximal radial ulnar joint you get pivot there um, so those are pivots and then you go to gliding joints and gliding joints the articular surfaces are really flat and you only get a really slipping or gliding movement between the bones um, like you would find between the carpals the wrist bones the tarsals and the articular processes of the vertebrae there really isn't a great degree of movement like I said it's just a little bit of slippage that goes on between the bones and then you have what's called the condyloid I'm going to the bottom uh, right here because the condyloid joints are made up of an oval articular surface of one bone fitting into something complementary on the other or depression on the other so both surfaces are kind of oval and you can get um, flexion and extension and you can also get um, you can get um, abduction and adduction like at your knuckles knuckle joints you can separate your fingers bring them together and you can flex and extend the fingers so those are examples there and then your your um, saddle joint is in the thumb and you have more of a swivel movement with this type of joint that you don't have with the other fingers so you can twiddle your thumbs and you can't do that with your other fingers so those are just general categories of, of some of the common joints based on the the articulating surfaces now the shoulder joint we're going to talk a little bit about joints but I am not going to focus a lot of attention on the test um, over all of these it's just a lot of information so I might mention these but we're really going to focus on the knee joint but the shoulder joint joint really is pretty loose it only is attached by way of the clavicle to the manubrium and so like I said where you have a lot of flexibility you sacrifice stability for that purpose of having more mobility so you have um, what I'd like to really have you focus on are the four muscles that make up or the four tendons that make now this picture is just showing you a little bit more um, giving you an idea of some of the structures associated with the shoulder joint and showing you some of the um, tendon sheaths and bursa that reduce friction in this joint this very movable joint the knee joint is the one I really want to focus on because it is the largest and most complex joint that we have in the body it's actually three joints in one surrounded by a single joint cavity so you have the joint between the femur and the patella that's the femoropatellar joint and then you have two joints between the condyles of the femur and little depressions or condyles that are found in the um, tibia and those are called the lateral and medial tibiofemoral joints there's at least 12 associated bursa and the capsule is reinforced by muscle tendons now in the anterior or front part of this joint the quadricep tendon gives rise to three broad ligaments so you have on either side of the patella you have the medial and lateral patella retinacula retinaculum um is singular retinacula is plural and then you have the patellar ligament which is um, the ligament that attaches the inferior surface of the patella to the tibial tuberosity of the tibia there are ligaments that stabilize the knee joint there are capsular or intracapsular and extracapsular ligaments these help prevent um, hyperextension of the knee so on the sides you have the fibular which is the lateral and tibial which is medial collateral ligaments so they stabilize and help to um, uh, give more support to the medial and lateral aspects of the knee and then in the back you have what are called the oblique popliteal ligament and the arcuate popliteal ligament so here's a look at the anterior aspect of the knee there's your um, patellar ligament there are there's the lateral retinaculum there's the medial retinaculum and there is the tibial collateral ligament 
there is the fibular collateral ligament. So this is the front part, and this is the lateral, the side of the knee, and this is the medial side of the knee. Then there are intracapsular ligaments. These prevent anterior-posterior displacement. They reside outside the synovial cavity, and you have one that's called the anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL, that attaches to the anterior tibia. And then you have the posterior cruciate ligament that attaches to the posterior tibia. And they're called cruciate because they cross. So they cross over each other. And the ACL is the one you hear about a lot, um, people having injuries to this particular ligament. So this is a view from the back of the knee. So this is going to give you a look at the oblique popliteal ligament right here. And there's your arcuate popliteal ligament. So from this side, you can see the tibial collateral ligament on the side again, fibular collateral ligament, um, and just giving you a look at that reverse side. Now, knee joint injuries. The knee can absorb great vertical force. It's designed to withstand blows, but it's vulnerable to vulnerable to horizontal blows, especially lateral blows to the extended knee, which are very common sports injuries. So the injury that you find that's very common involves three different knee structures depending upon the extent of the injury, and these are called the three C's. The collateral ligament, the cruciate ligaments, and the cartilages associated with that area. So you do have these cartilage pads that go in between the femur and the tibia, and these are called semilunar cartilages. And the medial one is called the medial meniscus. So you can see here in this picture that a hockey puck hitting the knee from the lateral direction, actually the force, the impact here, will make the bone separate, and in doing so, you tear the tibial collateral ligament, you tear the medial meniscus, which is that uh, cartilage pad, and you also tear the ACL. Now, sometimes you don't tear all three, but these are the three C's involved here with lateral blows to the extended knee, um, causing quite a bit of damage. There are other joint disorders that um, can occur, and one of them is a sprain. And this is where the ligaments reinforcing a joint are stretched and torn. And because ligaments don't have that many cells, there's a lot of non-living matrix and a poor blood supply, they repair themselves very slowly. And a lot of times, um, completely torn ligaments require prompt surgical repair. They don't really repair on their own. Cartilage injuries, as they're damaged, they tend to make noises. So they snap, they pop, and that can be um, indicative of overstressed or damaged cartilage. Very common type of aerobics injury, and it can be repaired very easily with atheroscopic surgery. Dislocation, this occurs when the bones are forced out of alignment. Usually when the bones are forced out of alignment, you're injuring other tissues. So you injure ligaments, and so that can cause sprains and, and results in a lot of inflammation and joint immobilization until those bones are put back in place. Sometimes serious falls and common sports injuries are the cause of dislocation. Now, a partial dislocation of a joint is called a subluxation, and this term appears on the, no on the notes. Subluxation is S-U-B-L-U-X-A-T-I-O-N, partially dislocated joint. And then there are degenerative conditions. Okay, we'll talk a little about um, inflammatory and degenerative conditions that um, can affect joints, and one of them is bursitis. And bursitis is an inflammation of the bursa, usually caused by a blow or a friction, you know, part of just maybe using a joint over and over and over again and irritating it. Um, so pain and swelling are common with this type of problem. Are treated with anti-inflammatory drugs, and sometimes if you have uh, too much fluid buildup or too much inflammation, they can aspirate the fluid, and uh, that will help relieve some of the pain. Tendinitis is an inflammation of the tendon sheaths, usually overuse. 
symptoms and treatments similar to bursitis. Arthritis, there's more than 100 different types of inflammatory or degenerative diseases that damage the joints. Arthritis is the most widespread crippling disease in the U.S. Symptoms, pain, stiffness, swelling of a joint, and acute forms are caused by bacteria and are treated with antibiotics. Chronic forms that we're going to talk about are the three types of arthritis, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gouty arthritis. Now, osteoarthritis, abbreviated OA, is the most common kind that you find. It's often called normal wear and tear arthritis, tends to affect more women than men, and any injury to the skeleton itself could result in arthritis. You may not feel any really major effects of it, but 85% of all Americans develop some form of OA, debilitating or not. There could be evidence on the skeleton that it's there. More prevalent in people as they age, that's why it's probably related to the normal aging process. So, treatments. It's slow, it's irreversible, mild pain relievers, try to keep yourself active, um, glucosamine sulfate is something that decreases pain and inflammation, um, and some of the things that can um, occur with OA over time is expo exposed bone ends due to cartilage loss, can thicken, enlarge, you can get bone spurs forming with this that can restrict movement. Um, the joints that are most often affected in the cervical area, so the neck, uh, lumbar, spine, fingers, knuckles, knees, hips, um, any joints that, are, that have a tendency to experience overuse and um, in time um, develop this, this type of problem. And it varies from person to person, of course. Rheumatoid arthritis, called RA, is a chronic inflammatory autoimmune disease. The cause is unknown and it has a very insidious onset. It usually arises between the ages of 40 and 50, but could occur at any age. So you notice joint tenderness, um, muscle atrophy. Um, the course of RA is marked with exacerbations and remissions. It flares up and then it, it goes away. So it begins with inflammation of the synovial membrane. And this inflammation causes swelling in the joint and the synovial membrane thickens into something called a panis. And this panis or this thickened tissue erodes the cartilage, scar tissue forms. The articulating bones and uh, ends end up connecting and in the end result in ankylosis, which is another word for a joint deformity. And it produces bent deformed fingers. And you may know people in your life that have rheumatoid arthritis and it's very disfiguring and very crippling over time. So the conservative plan, aspirin, long-term use of antibiotics, physical therapy, um, anti-inflammatory drugs to help with the inflammation produced from the disease process. There are medications, one is Embril that um, neutralizes harmful properties of inflammatory chemicals, but there's all kinds of treatments out there. Gouty arthritis is where you have uric acid crystals deposited in joints and soft tissues. And those uric acid crystals look like needles on both ends. And this really irritates the joint and causes the inflammatory response to be activated. Usually where you see gouty arthritis is at the base of the great toe the big toe. Um, if untreated, gouty arthritis can cause the bone ends to fuse and cause the joint to become immobilized. There are treatments like colchicine, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and glucocorticoids. Um, but those, it's a little overview of your three major types of arthritis that you may run into in your, um, in your journey.